I was I started the uh, session by talking about how nowadays when you try to take a selfie, it's a constant battle between what you want to focus on and what the AI component of your camera wants to focus on. So AI has become super pervasive into our lives. And we find that AI is everywhere. Sometimes we notice it consciously. Sometimes we don't even notice it. And AI is not something new. AI has been around for uh, quite some time. So this man here, you see Alan Turing, was considered as one of the founding fathers of artificial intelligence. And apart from that, he was also the man who cracked the Nazi code during the World War, which ensured that Germany was defeated. So Germany had this robust uh, encrypting machine called Enigma. The code was considered unbreakable. But then Alan Turing comes into the uh, picture and he breaks this code. And he also sows the uh, seeds for the beginning of AI revolution through what is known as his Turing test, which appears to be valid even now. And if you're interested in knowing more about Alan Turing and the Enigma, then you have a beautiful movie called The Imitation Game. Uh, you should all check that. And artificial intelligence is not just about robots. It's not about LLMs. It's definitely not only about uh, ChatGPT and other Gen AI tools. Artificial intelligence is an umbrella term that encompasses so many different aspects of uh, automation and other complex machine mechanisms. And artificial intelligence has become a part of almost every industry. And across industry, the process of hiring has even been outsourced to AI. So now it is basically a competition between one AI on the recruiter's side trying to fit, find a good candidate. And on the other side, it is an AI helping the candidate to present the best resume, the best presentation, best points. End of the day, it is basically a competition between AI and another AI to find which human is the most suitable for. And the manufacturing industry is one of the earliest industries to adopt robotics and uh, the AI uh, components into its process because there's a lot of heavy lifting and also there is a lot of scope for automation within the industry. And autonomous cars are all the rage. I'm sure every uh, driver or every uh, person here interested in uh, travel, interested in all these gizmos around uh, traveling are very, very uh, thrilled to uh, see what these autonomous cars would bring to the uh, roads. And what is interesting about these uh, cars is that they do not learn from code. They do not operate from code, but rather they learn just like human drivers by seeing, by observing, evaluating the uh, driving components from other drivers and also by looking at simulations, they kind of teach themselves to drive. They uh, evolve driving concepts based on what they learn. And medicine has also embraced robotics and AI to a major extent. The surgical systems you see on the screen called the Davency surgical systems have been used to perform more than millions of uh, surgical procedures across the world, not just in the US, but across as well. And when it comes to academia, I guess we are a bit lagging. We are catching up to the AI revolution a bit late. And uh, AI could be of great help, especially in the publishing uh, uh, aspect of academia. So no matter if you are a faculty, if you are a full-time researcher, if you are a faculty researcher, publication and has become one of the uh, key aspects or one of the key requirements for you to sustain in academia. This has been pushed as a requirement from funding agencies, from nodal evaluation agencies, from administrations. Uh, publications and research are also a very important component of the new education policy 2020 as well which means there is no circumventing around this uh, publication dilemma that we have at the moment. Something uh, happened this year that kind of challenged how we look at publication. So should we do research, should we publish to create a lasting impact or should we be focusing on producing papers with high impact factors? And this story of uh, the Nobel Prize won by uh, Professor Carrico was what challenged the notion. So Professor Carrico joins University of Pennsylvania way back in the 1980s and she starts her work on mRNA. 
how to package these molecules called mRNA and deliver them into human cells. She was not doing a very popular uh, research during her times and the university also noticed that she could not bring in enough grant money into the institution. She could not produce prestigious publications and uh, after a few years they kind of forced her to leave her job at the university university and join a German company. Come 2019, COVID hits the world and there is a dire need for producing vaccines that are effective. And the world suddenly starts looking at uh, Carico, who already had uh, good relationships among the uh, vaccine producing industries. And this mRNA vaccine comes out as the first vaccine ever to reach cl clinical trials and go into production for COVID and it is also considered one of the most effective vaccines. So this brings us back to the question. Carico's work did not produce impact, high impact factor uh, papers, but then it did create a lasting impact on the society. So as researchers, where should your focus be? On impact or on impact factors? So until November uh, 2022, not many of us were talking about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence was a word that belonged in the uh, ivory towers of uh, engineers, nerds, I would say. Come November uh, 2022, ChatGPT was unleashed on the world. And now in every nook and corner, you have people talking about uh, how wonderful AI is and also sometimes that we are doomed because of the advent of AI. And interestingly, uh, Elon Musk one, was one of the earliest investors in this company called OpenAI that developed ChatGPT. And what is ChatGPT? It is basically a chatbot. All of us have had experience with, say, ordering food from Swiggy, Zomato. And when something goes wrong with the food order, you do not fight with the restaurants, you do not fight with the delivery uh, agents, but rather you go on, on a full-blown fight with the Swiggy chatbot. ChatGPT is nothing more than a Swiggy chatbot. Then why are we all so excited about it? Because unlike a Swiggy chatbot, which has very minimal uh, responses to your queries, it has very limited versatility. ChatGPT can be very versatile. You can hold conversations for hours with uh, chat gpt about any topic you want any question you ask you have the answer and uh, google has been a very reliable partner to us for decades now but chat gpt kind of overtook google as our preferred go-to for asking questions because at the core we humans are a bit lazy and ChatGPT kind of capitalizes on this laziness to offer us ready-made solutions, which does not happen with Google. So with Google, Google offers you a lot of resources. You still have to go learn and figure them out. And also because ChatGPT stood on the shoulders of giants like Google itself, uh, it came out as a multilingual tool, which means not only the English-speaking crowd, but the non-English-speaking community could also access this tool and uh, get first-hand experience of how amazing it is. And just like with Google, how the keywords you use determine the quality of your results. With ChatGPT, there came an entire uh, swarm of uh, new professionals known as prompt engineers. So who are prompt engineers? Prompts are basically the instructions you give to any gen AI tool like ChatGPT. And it is these instructions that are processed and uh, used to give you the desired results. Prompt engineers are basically people who have figured out how to ask the right things to uh, gen AI tools, how to prime them to act in certain ways, how to coax them to be a bit more accurate in the results they provide and so on. So just when we were still reeling under the effects of ChatGPT, ChatGPT celebrated its one-year anniversary in November 2023. That is where uh, OpenAI announced what is known as Dev Day. And here, Sam Altman and the other stakeholders at OpenAI introduced something known as GPTs. These GPTs are basically custom-made chat GPTs, uh, which you can build on your own. It can be built for any of your purposes. So say, for instance, you're someone interested in cooking and you want to have a GPT, which can deal with everything around cooking. So what are the ingredients that are required for a dish, uh, how to prepare a dish, so on and so forth. So in such case, you can have your own cooking GPT. 
you're a researcher you want to have a gpt for your own data analysis you want to have a gpt that can help you with building your own models because GP gpt has dal e3 uh, integrated into it there is a lot of different functionalities it's not just about text you can also do designing you can create images there are so many uh, possibilities and this came as a sweet surprise and the surprise does not end here OpenAI also introduced what is known as the App Store for these GPTs. So just like how you go on uh, to your uh, App Store on your Android phones or on your Apple phones to download different applications, you can actually go to the OpenAI uh, Store to download the necessary GPTs. So you don't have to always custom build your GPTs. There are so many other people who custom make it. You can just go download uh, the required ones. And what are these uh, GPTs or uh, what are these AI models, the Gen AI uh, models, what are uh, they at their core? They are basically what are known as large language models. Large language models are AIs that learn from existing information, large chunks of information data we have dumped into the interwebs over the past several decades. They process them in very intelligent, clever ways, and then they present to you information in the way you actually require. The problem with these LLMs is that where are they learning uh, their information from? They learn their information from human-derived data. And the problem with us humans is that we are highly biased creatures. No matter what we look at, there is a bias. We have biases based on how things look, how people look, where they come from, what language they speak, what they eat, the gender, you name it, we have a bias. So knowingly or uh, even subconsciously, we have imparted all these biases into the knowledge that we have created over the decades. And these Gen AI tools, they are picking out on all these biases, amplifying them and throwing it right back at our faces. So how do these images look to you? So these were images created by an AI tool, Midjourney, I believe. Uh, and uh, these tools, uh, these images were created using simple prompts like what a typical prisoner looked like. At first glance, they look like amazing images. You can create an entire image out of nowhere just by using a few words. But take a pause, take a second look at these images. What is it that you see? The biases are pretty clear. So why should a nurse look like this? How many of you have had an opportunity be by treated by a nurse who looks like this. Say, even if you're in the US, do you think all nurses look like this? Why should a cleaner look something completely different from a nurse? Where did the AI learn that, okay, when the word nurse pops up, this is how the person has to look like. When the word cleaner pops up, this is how a person has to look like. So these are what makes AI a bit scary as well. They before we delve into understanding the different AI tools that can help us with academic writing and publishing, let us first acknowledge that AI is complex, it's multi-layered, it's evolving constantly, and we humans do not really understand this evolution completely. That is why as much as it is good to be excited about all these new developments, take anything that comes out of an AI tool with a pinch of salt, never trust it completely, and always make sure that you add a layer of human intervention or vetting before this data goes out into the public. 